quantum physics and the Dhamma, where do they meet? Where does one relate to the other? <clears throat> I think this is a topic that is necessary for me to talk about because I speak about both subjects and tend to jump from one to the other in the same conversation when I'm trying to lead towards uh, explaining something and sometimes it confuses people if you are not familiar with quantum physics or physics in general or um, astronomical physics then uh, you might actually just think what is he talking about one minute ago he was talking about Buddhism and now all of a sudden he's talking about science so um, actually if you understand both areas of thought or dogmas or w ways of viewing reality be it from a spiritual or metaphysical view mysterious view magical view or be it a scientific view which likes to break things down and categorize and define things put things in their place uh, this has a lot to do with what they talk about in Dhamma in when Buddhist thought and philosophy which is to do with the Dhamma but it is not the Dhamma the Dhamma is above and apart from all religions including Buddhism mm. always remember this so coming to why I like to use quantum physics to reveal the Dhamma so this is also one of the reasons why I like to use what you may call science or quantum physics and astronomical physics so macro and micro or actually the other way around quantum physics is micro and astronomical physics is macro so getting smaller inside down within uh, ever smaller or looking out far out beyond the galaxies into the universe and understanding its vastness and all of the laws and the phenomena which can be found within both of those realms which are actually beyond our limits of vision with the human eye and so therefore beyond the spectrum of our particular uh, size dimension I believe there are many dimensions, so does quantum physics and so does actually Buddhism and many magical or metaphysical philosophies. So, on the same way we exist as we see ourselves as bodies and mountains and streams and people and animals and houses, that is one particular size dimension and it's part of uh, illusory perception which is to do with uh, what in Buddhism is called Tilakana. One part of Tilakana has three things in Tilakana is Anicca, which means impermanence. Uh, we do not see impermanence, it is covered by a veil of illusion. The reason we do not see this is because we are physically manifest within this size dimension, what I am calling a size dimension, meaning the limits of our perception and the way our minds are conditioned by rupa and nama, form and name. Mm. So we see a mountain and think it is very permanent, we do not see it changing. In fact it is actually eroding, therefore disintegrating. However, very slowly, if you were to watch a sand glass you could see the sand trickling through into the bottom of the glass and know that time is passing and that it is disintegrating. But when you look at a mountain, it is so large that you cannot see it disintegrating. You are therefore blind 
to the fact that all things are impermanent. You cannot experience all things that way. It is very difficult. This is both uh, Buddhist and scientific. In fact, the Buddha's way of looking at things and analyzing and investigating things, I find is very scientific indeed to understand their nature. The only thing difference was that he was dealing with immaterial things which science does not get to grips with at all. It only gets to grips with the material or that which it can prove using material methods. But all that is completely immaterial and cannot be defined or explained with material methods is not investigated by science. That's the only difference. So another part of uh, Tilakana, or the three things we do not see, because we are not with right view, not enlightened, as unenlightened people call it. <laughs> Um, I prefer to call it uh, having attained right view because enlightened and unenlightened becomes also a conditioned thing which you imagine and it can actually just become another obstruction so that's enlightenment out of the window for the moment I call it right view so we have not right view we do not see tilakana which is anicca impermanence dukkha unsatisfactoriness because things never remain as they were in their original condition and anatta that with all things are without owner uh, with ownership does not exist this is not my body it will die as it wishes and I cannot command it it is not mine it is not me it is not self uh, no particular quality or thought or emotion we can have can be called that is it, that is myself, that is where I am, that is who I am, that is where my soul is. So, it's not that nothing's happening, there's lots of consciousness of feelings, emotions, conversations with people, interactions, reactions, consciousnesses. Life is an experience of all these things which happen within your five khandhas, the five components of your human, precious human being body, bodily being. So the experience is there. Not self is the third of tilakana, or third of the three conditions. Not self does not mean we do not exist. It means we do not exist as any particular thing, always like that, unchangingly and ever like that. There is nothing that is unchanging. But there is something that perpetuates eternally between all of those thoughts which are dying and born, all of those feelings which rise and fade, all of those experiences which are and come into memory and are gone. Mm. It's all imprinted, <coughs> which is where we get back to quantum physics. Quantum physics has uh, two major theories, one called the string theory and one called the field theory. Uh, both of them are shapes used to try to explain something that is immaterial or so small, so micro, that it cannot be explained in our normal material terminology or the normal laws of physics. So whether we see the quantum field as an ocean or a field of potential and possibility which only comes into being according to quantum science when an observer, a conscious observer, looks at it. And so as I look at the table, its tableness and the fact that it is a table remains there, but only in my mind, only in that place and time. Elsewhere it is for other things, perhaps non-existent, perhaps not a table. It might be in a different place, most definitely if standing in a different place it would be in a different place. 
So as soon as you look away, according to quantum science, and according to me, uh, the table ceases to exist, and also simultaneously coexists in all possible positions, because depending on who is looking at it, which person, which conscious observer, and where they are standing, that is what relates as to where the table is. So, in fact, if you do not put yourself in the story and take yourself out of the matter, you will realize that the fact of where the table is, is not in relation to you at all. It is where it is. And it is, in fact, everywhere. Because if you look at it from all the different points within everywhere, you will see that it is in all the different points which can be seen from all the different points of everywhere. So, John stood over to the north, might see the table, is to his south, down in front of that tree, whereas you who are in the south would see the table poking out from behind the tree to your north. Where is the table, I ask? Who knows? It depends. Everywhere and nowhere, all places at the same time, and in no particular place at any particular time. Here is where quantum physics proves this through the discovery of subparticles which actually do behave like this and have been seen to exist in two places at the same moment. So some quantum scientists believe in this quantum field that they see as a flat field of just potential and that as observers turn to perceive things or focus on things then reality is created within the confines of that focus and perceived through the mind of the observer as soon as the observer looks away reality melts back into that one quantum field of potential and possibility and becomes absolute elsewhere everything and nothing at the same time just potential pure quanta it's quantum yes <clears throat> the other theorists believe in the string theory which is designed along a string along a line of events quantum events so I don't want to get into that. What I want to get into is the fact that the string theory uses a shape as its method of conditioning your understanding of how this immaterial physics law or Dhamma, if we would say in a religious way, or our, as Buddhists would say, and as perhaps people in the future will say when science and religion and magic have ceased to exist and only true vicha exists, the true, true right view of the way things are, the true nature of things in the future. Maybe Dhamma will be the word, maybe it won't, but in the moment it's Dhamma. Dhamma is universal, which is why I don't see quantum physics or the Buddhist path as separate. I just see them as two different conditioned methods of deconditioning oneself and finding what lies behind the reality, the illusory reality which we condition ourselves to perceive and are conditioned to perceive and are limited to perceive that and not more by the limits of our senses and the equipment which we have with our material bodies and those realms of experience which we might be able to access depending on how advanced or able our immaterial aspects of our consciousness is, be that the astral body, exploring the mental immaterial realms of Arupa Jhana using mental focus and control or a number of other methods. So. 
the limits are not equal with each person. No, all people are born equal, but what you become uh, that depends on your efforts and your the accumulation of your efforts or attainments, or as religious people might say, uh, merits. True merit is attained through the effort of uh, superarse, you say in Spanish, uh, to superior oneself, to to better oneself, to do better than one has ever done before, to transform oneself into something even better or purer, or depending on what one sees as one's ultimate goal. For me, it is what Buddhists call Buddhahood, a right view, correct view, uh, enlightened view, true insight and spontaneous self-liberating thought process which recognizes all that it experiences as reality but not as a conditioned reality as an unconditioned reality which is uh, the same as to say to become one with the universe to become one with everything but whilst remaining no, this is hard to describe, remaining. One is not separate, but the sensation of being the watcher remains. So, back to the point, is that the quantum physics theorists have two theories, each of which uses physical shape or form as a method of description. This instantly conditions your understanding of these laws or dhammas which they explain in quantum physics. Uh, the reason for this is that the human mind is ruled by the two great laws or dhammas of rupa and nama, form and name. And so these are the limits within which we can imagine things or describe things within our languages we have name uh, our five candors is some of them all of them are name but not all of them are form some of them are form and name your body it's called a body it has a conditioned picture in your mind when you say the body and it's also physical so it has a form mm. But uh, Vetana is the second candle of the five, is uh, sensation, uh, feelings, so emotions. Uh, they're not physical, they're immaterial. It's a sensation within your heart. It has no physical form or shape. That is only Nama. And so uh, our minds are ruled by Rupa and Nama, form and name. And therefore, when we intuit, what is meant by the theory of string theory or field theory or enlightenment or the true way things are or the Dhamma is not really any of those things. It's something that has to be intuited without words. And this can only be done in the formless mind state of Arupa Jhana, formless Jhana. Jhana means absorption more or less, to be absorbed, fully absorbed. So in meditation there is a point of absorption where you forget yourself, your body and everything and you become unified with the object of your meditation. Be that a single object of focus or just the atmosphere or environment around you or within you, just the general abstract feeling of everything as one single object, seen as one single object. This is an even better and more direct way to access the Arupa Jhana in meditation. Only this way can it be accessed. Otherwise, you have to listen to slightly incorrect, adept descriptions of the way things are, as you are doing now in this tape, which I am making. Now, there comes a point in your contemplation be you a philosopher or a Buddhist meditator or even a quantum scientist 
or just somebody looking for the truth. If you think about things enough and you study things enough, you will notice duality, good and bad, up and down, future, past, before, after, better, worse. Hmm? And you will notice this duality. This is the duality we exist in because of our minds. Duality is not a true Dhamma that is inherent in all things. Rather, it is us who have separated ourselves as separate observers looking at a universe which is completely apart and separate from us. We do not see the connection. This is what causes us not only to be impure through wrong view of separateness and make us able to kill, steal and do other things which are harmful because to think harmfully one must be harmful against something that is other. If one cannot find no otherness, then one cannot find no need or desire to destroy that which is other. Oneself or that which one considers to be essential to one's existence would not be harmed or wanted to be harmed. So when right view is attained and one sees the unified aspect of our existence, that we are not separate from this universe, we are actually right inside it, not us with the universe outside it. And that both of these views, just as creation and destruction, and inside the universe, or outside it looking in, inside it looking out, which way are we? Both of these views are dualistic views and can be tossed around forever and never answered. The Buddha would remain silent to such conundrums, for such conundrums can never be answered, and such conundrums are precisely the train of thought which holds us here within samsara, which is illusory thinking. The realm of illusion is not a realm, it is just an illusory form of thinking which makes us appear to be in this realm. If illusory forms of thinking are destroyed through right view and through insight attained through the arupa jhanas, then perhaps we can rise above this and become masters and adepts of our own fate and see where this would take us further, for beyond this point has only been said to be Nibbana, but has not been given to anybody who has not attained it as a description, for it cannot be described. We shall only see when we have attained that final deconditioning and stepped beyond and reached the far shore where we will be able to see clearly and have cleared the dust from our eyes, be it with quantum physics, Buddhism, philosophy, or simply the necessity and deep wish and desire for awakening and to put an end to all this, which one knows in one's heart, in truth, is all a dream and was nothing but a dream, has never been anything but a dream. Awake.